Hello and welcome to Gritty Reboot, the show where we make fun of TV's dark side. I'm Kevin James, and with me are my co-hosts, Sarah Dunaway and Hunker, uh, <laughs> Hunker Markdom. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> Flawless delivery, keep it all in. Sarah, it says here that I'm supposed to address you as the Serpent Queen. Um, but why? It's about time. After spending most of my life as a mere serpent princess, I was finally able to murder and connive my way up the line of succession. I expect you to refer to me exclusively by my royal title now. Yes, my liege. This doesn't make me worried about our future together at all. Hunter, how are you? I heard uh, since watching this week's episode, you've become a bit of a swimming hole aficionado. Well, let me tell you, Kevin, you've got to explore a lot of holes before you find the right one. That's true. You just got to dive right in there. <laughs> All right. These these introductions are going poorly. Let's move on. Here at Gritty Reboot, we recently made an amazing decision. We decided, after watching season one of Riverdale, let's watch less of this show. <laughs> So we skipped all of season two, and we are going in stone cold blind for season three of Riverdale, episode one. Hunter even reminded us to skip the recap so we wouldn't find out anything. I was just about to say, we had the pact to skip the recap. So we have, I mean, besides Sarah, who saw a couple episodes of season two way back when, we have no idea what happened in those 22 episodes. And we were just like, all right, season three premiere, let's figure this out. I'm so excited. I think this worked great. Honestly, nothing that I watched of season two helped me to understand what was happening here. <laughs> nothing in my life experience. <laughs> nothing could have prepared me for this. It's it's funny because there are parts that <laughs> there are parts that are like such clear progressions of like where we were at the end of season one. And there are parts that have come way the hell out of left field. Yes. Like everyone is in a gang now. <laughs> Oh, good. I'm so good. <laughs> Except for Veronica, who I assume is off pining on the sidelines, like, guys, let me in. And I was like, ah, oh, we'll think about it. Oh, are you serpent material, though? <laughs> sure, we'll let in almost everybody, but probably not you. I mean, we, we literally have a dog <laughs> as a serpent, but I also I mean... love, it's like the silliest floofy mop dog. It's like like, can't you get a pit bull or something? <laughs> Why do you have this dog? It, it's like a Shih Tzu or something. Uh, yes. It looks like Hot Dog does in the comics where he's just like a big mop of hair. And that's cool. But as a gang dog, he seems very ineffective. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he's going to mop up the competition. <laughs> I know that we're probably going to have some changes as we go through trying to figure out how, how season three unfolded the way it has. But did you guys have any title ideas for this besides what it is titled, which was simply Labor Day? <laughs> I failed miserably at this. Sarah, however, came through with multiple titles. And so we have decided to collaborate in the way men and women often collaborate. Sarah did all the work and my name is attached. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So my alternate titles were Swim Fan. <laughs> The Hunger Games Mocking Jones, <laughs> Robin Hood Men in Fights, and Blade Virginity. <laughs> okay, all of those were way better than mine. Wow, Swim Fan is a real reference. <laughs> so they, yeah, that's for real. This is just part of our ongoing attempt to really get Generation Z, you know? Mm -hmm. They're big Swim Fan fans. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. My title ideas are not as strong as that. I Because of the Southern courtroom, I had Archie Kiss Finch. Um, <laughs> I had Operation Escape Veronica's Clutches, which I think is Archie's main motivation for choosing to go to prison. <laughs> and uh, I think since they decided to suddenly throw the supernatural element into Riverdale, it's kind of a bad ripoff of other things that have done it better. Maybe the title could have been uh, weirder stuff instead of Stranger Things or <laughs> the Midnight Area instead of the Twilight Zone. Yeah, that <laughs> that makes sense. I had Ranger Things because <laughs> of the bows and Stranger Things, but then Kevin said that was my weakest one, so I dropped it. I had Firewoman, which only makes sense if you know it's a song by the band The Cult, and that's where the real joke was, and I was like, I that's that's not good enough. It can't make the cut. Yeah, I would not have gotten that. Sorry. Yeah, so 
Labor Day, definitely a weak title. Apparently it was a coming of age film, but like it's it's just a holiday. Yeah, it doesn't really, that title isn't tied to any of the themes or action that go on in this episode. And there's a lot of action and activity all over the place. Does that oh, say yes. it was a 2013 film? Yeah. That obviously was really well known and popular because I don't even know what it is. I had never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, great pick. Is this a theatrical release? <laughs> I don't know. Straight to DVD, which maybe <laughs> existed then? I don't know. It was apparently also a 2009 novel, which I had also not heard of, which makes a little more sense because literature is dying. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that has stayed in Riverdale is they're still making cultural references that tie in little or not at all to the plot and seem strange coming out of these characters' mouths. All right, play the clips, Hunter. Of course, given the fact that Archie will most likely be walking the Green Mile while the rest of us are walking the stage of graduation, I understand if you're not up for it. It's not going to work, Daddy. Your Yago-like attempt to keep me and Archie apart, it'll fail. What does some guru who's running a Heaven's Gate commune for pregnant runaways and wives of serial killers have to say about my diaries? Listening to what your soul is telling you. Okay, I'm listening to my soul and what it's saying is get the hell away from your mother because she's been body snatched so moose you know those movies where friends make a pact to lose their virginity by the end of the school year uneasy sits the crown last one in gets the stinky maple <laughs> if the unthinkable happens i will be taking the bus every week with all the other prison widows and bringing you Magnolia Cupcakes from New York. Not one, but two Shakespeare references. <laughs> yes. Uh, we're talking about the movies with characters who agree to lose their virginity in pacts, right? <laughs> yes. That's uh, <laughs> Shakespeare, famous for writing American Pie. <laughs> the Iago reference, obviously, was a reference to Jafar's parrot in Aladdin. Well, that's actually a great... <laughs> Great, because <laughs> um, Hiram's response to that Veronica line is, I don't know what you're talking about. And I really sincerely believe that because it's been, what, 35 years since high school? He's probably like, I have not read Othello. I do not get this quote. <laughs> that and, yeah, FP misquotes Shakespeare's Henry IV with the heavy lies the head that wears the crown. But we kind of got where he was going. Mm-hmm. I like that we got a vintage Green Mile reference from Cheryl. Yeah, we haven't seen that since season one. <laughs> and there was also a reference to the very real world phenomenon of sticky maples. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have more to say about that again, but I might, at least we do have some touchstones where we understand what a sticky maple is. So they're carrying some stuff forward from season one. It was it was so funny though. Like I, I felt like Veronica's reaction should have been like, "Whoa, that was like one of the worst things that happened to me when I first moved here." And you're making a joke about that? It's been a while. Um, <laughs> wait. So Heaven's Gate was the group that like all of them died in matching sweatsuits and Nikes. Yeah, tracksuits and Nikes, which is really inconsistent with Alice's attire in this episode, which was my immediate thing that I noticed. Um, but yes, they they all. Uh, Killed themselves in a big house in the San Diego area, I believe. Yeah. Okay. I was trying to make sure that was like the same one and I wasn't confusing it with Jonestown. Nope. That one was much, much bigger. That's what they would call it if Jughead started a cult. Yes. They've got that reference locked down and ready to go. Oh, man. They should. That's what they should call the Serpent Compound, Jonestown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, we have another Magnolia Cupcakes reference, too. So Veronica has not grown or changed as a character. <laughs> I'll be honest. How surprised are you? <laughs> not at all. Yeah, no. Throughout this episode, she's also just still like, how do I feel about my father? And it's like, we already, we finished this so long ago. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, especially now that he's framing her boyfriend for murder, I feel like she should have pretty clear feelings about this. Right? How is she still like, hey, I'm done with you? <laughs> All right. So there was 22 episodes in season two. 22 episodes that we completely skipped. And Veronica's having the same exact character struggle as when we left off. <laughs> yeah, I have 23 questions of things we don't know. And my most important question by far is, how is Veronica still on this shit? <laughs> right? 
why is she still on this show? Because she's absolutely still my least favorite character. And there's a bunch of people that we meet for the first time in this episode. Yeah, Sweet Pea just rocketed way above Veronica. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. So did um whatever the ghoulie leader chick's name is. Penny? Penny, yes. Penny? Yeah. Already like her better than Veronica. Yeah, she's great. She's got like a vintage season one Alice energy to her. <laughs> oh, yeah. Maybe she's one of Alice's many children. <laughs> oh, I'm so super down with that. I know. I really like that twist. I'm already really excited. <laughs> um, so st- uh, where this episode opens, since we haven't touched on that yet, what are your thoughts? Uh, on what? Just like, I guess the opening, the fact that we only missed a semester. They're like in the summer before junior year. Yeah, that was that was weird. The decision to have all of the first two seasons cover exactly one year of time was interesting. <laughs> Normally, high school based shows, you know, they track pretty closely to actual high school. Like one year on the show is one year in the real world. Yes, time is just an illusion on this show. It's meaningless. <laughs> I mean, all I notice is Jughead is now sporting a sick tattoo in the first shot that we get. So that's what's changed. He's still got the beanie, though. Yes. Mm-hmm. He's engaging in his favorite summer activity, leering at his girlfriend at the swimming hole. <laughs> okay, well, wait. I, I already have notes for this because as we learn just a few minutes later in the episode... They have not all been to the swimming hole together yet. Yeah, I have no idea what was going on with that. Are they talking about a different swimming hole? But it looks like the same one. I don't know. I don't get it. Oh, is that like his narration as he's writing? Maybe is he writing a new book? Is he writing the same book? Is it a series? I I hope it's the same book and he's like sending it off to publishers. Like, all right. So the first part was pretty subdued and realistic. But I have some notes. Uh, what's with the weird supernatural twist in the uh, 500th page? <laughs> Remember when we covered episode one and I said Jughead is a ghost? Yes. My new theory is that... He's a ghoulie. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. My new theory is everything we've seen on this television show is just Jughead fiction. That would make sense. I, I started writing when I was in high school and I wrote mangled confusing messes and that's what this show has become so i think the swimming hole was actually legitimately supposed to be him like we in a different reality we could have spent our summer at the swimming hole but in uh, this world we spent it in a courthouse it is so weird or it's that... a time travel story and he just hasn't introduced that element yet. Hey, for season four <laughs> it is so weird that even his imagination though he is the type of douche who wears a swim shirt. <laughs> yeah. For the man who has nothing to hide, but still wants to. <laughs> and we quickly find out Archie is on trial for murder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most of my notes on the first watch ended in question marks where I'm like, Archie's on trial for murder? Okay. <laughs> it's like, I know he did some pretty awful se- things to the scenery that he's been chewing, but I mean, no. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And we later learn, we later learn this is a juvenile trial. Yes. I mean, my second question was, why couldn't it have been Veronica's murder? But (laughs) Yeah, good question. Yeah, I do feel like he would have been tried as an adult because that's how this country does it. But also... Well, you forget he's white. This is a good point. Um, It's introduced that... His defense is that uh, Smithers actually committed the murder, which I just wanted to be like, objection, I've seen this one. It was baby Maggie who killed Mr. Burns, (laughs) not Smithers. Okay. That was the thing. They said it was like the father's doorman. So was it Smithers? Because then later they reference it as Andre. I thought it was Smithers too. That was my first thought. His girlfriend's father's doorman. On a rewatch, they say Andre did it. So his name could be Andre Smithers. Yes, yeah. Andre 3000 Smithers. <laughs> There's no reason that both of these things aren't true. Can we, <laughs> until we get further evidence, can we just live in a world where we think it's Smithers who's the killer? <laughs> oh, it's for sure Smithers, in my mind. <laughs> and my mom, unequivocally good. Just like I am at my assassin job. <laughs> pew, pew. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There was so much stuff that they brought up that was from episodes we missed where, like, 
Archie was leading vigilante groups, carrying gas cans around. Two vigilante groups. I did see some of that. <laughs> I saw Archie organize a vigilante group, which, yeah, was a thing that happened. I have to assume it turned out just like the Simpsons episode where Homer leads a vigilante group. Similar. <laughs> oh, Kent, I'd be lying if I said my men weren't committing crimes. <laughs> <laughs> So the DA is going after Archie and saying this kid belongs in prison because he's a stone cold murderer. His mom, Molly Ringwald, is inexplicably his defense lawyer, which seems like a conflict of interest. She reminds the jury that Archie once cooked breakfast for people, which totally makes up for the time he apparently beat up a kid with broken legs. (laughs) <laughs> and, po- and pointed a gun at Sweet Pea's face and said, I'll do it. Yes! Like, I don't know, Archie still seems pretty bad. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's important for you to consider that Archie is mommy's bestest little boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a... <laughs> it's also funny because, I mean, I feel like part of Molly Ringwald's speech actually, like, should hurt Archie's chances. Like, she yes. says... She says, he invited both friends and enemies to safety. And if I was the judge, I'd be like, hold on. How does a 17-year-old have multiple enemies? Yes. Mm -hmm. I didn't know who the enemies were supposed to be. I don't know what happened, what sort of Hurricane Katrina disaster necessitated this. I guess it was riot night, whatever that was. I'm assuming a night of riots, but knowing Riverdale, it's probably something completely stupid and not related to that at all. (laughs) I don't know, but... That's the thing, like, when you're openly admitting that the person you're defending has whole groups of people as enemies, he's clearly involved in some really shady stuff. Yeah. And then immediately after those opening statements, uh, the jury goes to deliberate, because that's exactly how trials work. (laughs) Well, I think those are the closing statements. I guess they were supposed to be, but the lawyers weren't referencing any evidence they put forward or any (laughs) witness statements. They were just like, hey, what I want you to think about is that maybe he didn't do it. <laughs> like, that's, if that's a closing, very poor. No, good chances. Attorney McCoy, not Mayor McCoy, I was surprised to learn, uh, says they've got a 50-50 chance. What do you think Archie's chances are? Maybe I'd say 50-50. And later, the jury does deadlock 50-50, so that's weird. Yeah, that happens all the time. But uh, So Archie's then, like, moping as the jury deliberates and i like that first of all the biggest character growth is that jughead's wearing suspenders like a human being (laughs) he's changed our little baby's growing up before our eyes (laughs) he's growing up so fast but i like how archie is worrying about like going to prison and jughead's just there munching on a box of animal crackers talking about swimming holes what made us stop going uh probably when we got covered in leeches was that us or was that a movie? That was definitely that was us. us. The whole scene is so weird, especially, and I think all of us pointed this out separately in our notes. The The courthouse feels like it was shot to be a southern courthouse. Mm-hmm. Like everyone's like dressed up and women are like fanning themselves. And like there's like soft yellow light. It looks like it was filmed directly from my cousin. <laughs> My cousin it Vinny. really does. It was insane because like everyone's drenched in sweat. The place must smell like a jock strap. Even the building looked like it would be some sort of like southern building in Georgia. It's <laughs> odd. So when the judge comes forth and says because the jury is still deliberating that they're going to put off making a decision on this court case until after Labor Day, it seemed strange. Apparently, there were some other reasons originally for this um, twist in the plot. Oh, yeah. They really dialed in on this Southern feeling, and I think uh, this alternate scene might have gotten cut because things got a little bit confusing. But luckily, we do have audio from the set because they did shoot this scene. All right, well, let's give it a listen. The court calls to the stand, Mr. Archibald Andrews. Now... Mr. Andrews, why are you sweating so profusely? Your Honor, it's like 95 degrees in here with 100% humidity. How does this courtroom not have air conditioning? What an impertinent question, young man. As you well know, we have a swamp cooler in the back. 
but I am afraid it is on the fritz. Until it's repaired, I suggest you avail yourself to a cool glass of sweet tea. I excuse me, where am I? What year is it? Another ludicrous inquiry. I believe we are all aware that we are in the parish of just outside New York City, and the year is 1930. Defense attorney and mother Molly Ringwald speaking. Your Honor, motion for the court to adjourn until these facilities are repaired. It's obvious my client's son is delusional from the heat. Overruled. You make me regret my decision to allow your defense, Mrs. Andrews. As you no doubt recall, I had my objections. I remember your objections. I believe you chuckled for two minutes at the notion of a female attorney and said I belong in the kitchen. Then I called you a toad-faced bigot and a Kentucky Fried asshole. I find it unlikely I would forget if you called me such things. Oh, that's right. I was saying that in my head until just now. Must be my female emotions getting the best of me. Mom, this isn't helping. Can't we just get this postponed? I'm itching something fierce to run down to the creek and hunt for tadpoles while Veronica and Betty play on the jug and washboard. Oh no, Archie! Not you too! What's happening here? How did it get so southern? This is no time for a family squabble. I will have order in this court. Uh, my name is not Eustace H. Thibodeau. Look outside, Your Honor. The sun is setting over the swamp, the mosquitoes are coming out, and... Oh God, I can see a bunch of sharecroppers setting off with nets and mason jars to catch fireflies. Can we just call it a day? Oof. Maybe Jeremiah Smothers can tell me more stories about how he used to play a fiddle contest against Old Scratch back during the War of Northern Aggression. Now that you mention it, I do have an engagement for a crawdad boil at the O'Hara plantation this evening, and I do so love a crawdad boil. Ladies and gentlemen, court is adjourned until after Labor Day. Yeah, that did get confused pretty quickly. I think that KJ Appa didn't quite know how to do a southern accent on top of his American accent as a New Zealander. It got lost pretty quickly. <laughs> maybe that's why they cut it after all. But maybe this is a real shift for Riverdale. They were thinking of subtly changing the setting to the Louisiana swamps. I believe both southern states also use the term lightning bug instead of firefly. But, oh I my mean, god. Obviously, the writers didn't do their research. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Texas. We didn't have fireflies or lightning bugs. Uh, we had cicadas and mosquitoes. <laughs> they're fireflies to me, but I know some people get really heated about that and want to call them lightning bugs, which makes them sound way less cool. Yeah. Uh, this whole scene was totally out of place. The whole courtroom felt like it didn't belong in the Riverdale universe, especially since the last time we saw Riverdale, it was knee deep in snow. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, it's pretty accurate to major municipal buildings in New York State to not have air conditioning. This was a huge issue in public schools, for instance, that like you'd come back in September or even towards the end of the year in June and it was just boiling. Ugh, that sounds brutal. In the building because it was such a short period of time that it would be hot that they were like, ah, why would we put money into that? <laughs> So they just they just spent all summer in court sweating their yeah. balls off. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens in many upstate New York courts. Yeah, I think there was probably a way to film it, though, where it didn't come across as Southern. <laughs> yes, that, that was weird. Like, just put in standing fans instead of hand fans, and suddenly mm -hmm. it makes it way more sensible. And don't shoot it with, like, the yellow filters that just communicate Southern setting. Totally. Yeah. But I think everyone was getting irritable from the heat because Luke Perry decides to punch some guy in the face. And at this point in the show, we don't know his name. So I was just like, <laughs> Hiram, Hiram Lodge. I didn't know that on first watch. Like, I was just like, Luke Perry just went off and punched someone. It oh, was... was he not in the first season? No. He was not. Oh. Also, okay. Luke Perry lived despite season one finale where he looked like he was fatally shot. Or is he a ghost, too? <laughs> <laughs> oh, too soon. <laughs> but I did, oh, oh. I forgot about that. But it is funny because, yeah, since we didn't know anything it comes in, Hiram just like, hey, Archie, have a good weekend. And then Rick, Luke Perry just decks him for that. 
Have a terrific weekend. Oh. Oh. I had all these questions in my brain where I'm like, what? Alice has bangs? FP's not in prison? Luke Perry's alive? And then suddenly <laughs> he's punching someone who I've never seen before in this show. No one tells my son to enjoy his free time. <laughs> He's going to be working construction, I'll have you know. <laughs> That's how he got hot, and it's how he'll stay hot. <laughs> we survived the first courtroom scene, and luckily they return to their old stomping grounds at Pops. Mm -hmm. And that's where we meet D Doily's friend Ben, who looks like he really wants to ask a swell girl to the sock hop. <laughs> <laughs> Ben, this is another character we've never seen. I don't know, but he literally looks like he walked out of a completely different TV show <laughs> that is set in the 1950s. Can we talk about the Dilton Doily plot and how terribly it was handled? I, yeah. So, like, Ben is this kid who looks like he's we had star in a Seventh Heaven reboot, but he seems like mm -hmm. he's Dilton Doily's abusive boyfriend because he's like, "Shut up, Doily." That's the first thing we hear him say. Dilton, Ben. What are you guys playing? It's called Griffin's. Shut up, Doily. It's, it's, they're just playing a board game, like a tabletop RPG, and Jughead's like, hey, what you playing? And they get all secretive, and there's, like, intense music, and Jughead, like, a normal person's like, well, I wasn't that interested to begin with, so I guess I'll just go back to my friends. <laughs> but apparently that was the setup for the season's overarching murder plot about the Gargoyle King, which is a choice. <laughs> yes. First of all, they're playing a tabletop RPG with two people, which doesn't really work. You need, like, a party for a dungeon crawl. Not yeah, who's DMing there? And what's the other person doing with no one to play with? It could be a game, like, similar to Gloomhaven. Oh, God, I'm giving away a lot right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I set the trap? Sarah, you walked right into it. You can play Gloomhaven one player or two player, however many players you want, really. You're officially the biggest nerd on the podcast until either Kevin <laughs> or I speaks again. Yes. Let's go back to talking about Namiki Makie <laughs> fountain pens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, you, re you reclaimed it. Wait, uh, I'll come up with something b before long. <laughs> Namiki it's... Makie is also my favorite Hawaiian Christmas song. <laughs> that does sound like it'd be a Christmas song from Hawaii. It'd be beautiful. But anyway, it's it, so this whole thing, like, Jughead apparently got suspicious from that because, like, later on at Cheryl's pool party, which we'll get to eventually, like, he just stares at Dilton Doyle, who's staring off in space, and then Dilton turns dramatically to Jughead, and there's like a dun -a. Yeah, they have the most thunderous music for this shot, where it's just Dilton Doyle sipping from a red cup, standing beside a pool in the bright summer sun. It's so poorly set up. <laughs> None of this adds up to, like, oh, season long, overarching. A cult murder plot. Uh, you know, <laughs> I like surprises. <laughs> it was a surprise. The show is full of them. Uh, then we have the the gang talking about the how they're gonna resolve Archie's imminent arrest. Well, imminent imprisonment. I yeah, guess. that sounds right. And they say like, let's search Shadow Woods. And then we'll go talk to the centaurs in the Forbidden Forest. <laughs> and, like, let's ask Hagrid what we should do next. I don't know where the show is going. It's getting really weird. I'd like to point out the amazing world-building details of we need to search Shadow Woods by Shadow River. Just perfect. Like, <laughs> let's, let's, not, let's not think up other ideas for things to be made. Not like named. Penumbral Pool or something. They're just like, no, same name. <laughs> But yeah, Archie is like, this is stupid. I'm probably going to be found guilty. Let's not worry about this. Let's just have a fun Labor Day weekend. And it made me think of what Labor Day means to me. So I put together a little audio clip that I think <laughs> best represents what a normal Labor Day weekend is like. Hunter, if you would play that. Absolutely. After the worst summer ever, I want us to have a great, normal Labor Day weekend. And you don't want to miss it. Shop today and find amazing deals storewide on dining, living, bedroom, and mattresses. And best of all, the more you buy, the more you save. If that's what you really want, Archie Kids. It is, Ronnie. 
Archie would be a great spokesperson for things. Yeah, I actually was like leaving for work and Kevin was like, wait, stop. There's something you need to hear. <laughs> and you just said, oh God. <laughs> what has he what has he done this time? <laughs> but you know, the rest of the episode they proceed to have the most normal Labor Day weekend that I could possibly imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Starting with when Cheryl walks in. Greetings, chums. I wanted to let you know that after the three amazing months I just had with Tony riding on motorcycles cross country. <laughs> yes. She's yeah, just she gonna has wear the best progressively address. less clothing in every episode. I'm really looking forward to her signature cherry red loincloth. <laughs> she dresses like she has a job riding the mechanical bull at the White Worm now. Uh-huh. <laughs> Which she might. We don't now know. Now that she is a serpent too. And a biker because she's like, oh, me and Tony rode cross country on our motorcycles. <laughs> and I, I, I have to ask, is Cheryl still a ghost? Because she rattles off this whole monologue to the gang. And no one reacts verbally to her. I didn't even notice that. Because, yeah, she just walks in. There's a slow motion scene where they're just like, oh, well, yeah, like, let's just focus on this actress's rack. And then uh, she just talks about, like, I had a wonderful summer. Archie's probably getting life imprisonment. Come to my pool party. Bye. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's, so, it's so weird, but her whole entrance was specifically just to titillate the audience. There was no other reason for any of that happening. Yes. <laughs> then there's later, like, also a scene where she walks by the pool, and I think I was supposed to be looking at her body, which is a great body, but I was just laughing at how high her heels were. Me and too. just why someone would wear those to a pool party, which they never would. No normal person <laughs> does that. You're going to slip and fall. <laughs> there are splashes with pools. <laughs> Safety first, Cheryl. <laughs> well, they're having a pool party at her burned down mansion, so I guess there's no real concern about safety. Yeah, it was kind of like season one, she dressed a little bit risque, and now they've taken this character all the way to like, she's a stripper. Her next but entrance like, like is going to be like worker, the classic obviously. flash dance scene. <laughs> <laughs> but with maple syrup. Yes. <laughs> Just like pulls a cord, a bucket of maple syrup, pours down her body. <laughs> okay, so after we hear about Cheryl's pool party, we cut over to the Cooper home where we find out a whole lot more stuff has changed. Yes, yeah, so one of my notes was, wow, Alice is in a cult? No, wait, that actually makes a lot of sense. <laughs> that seems fine, yeah. Like she exclusively shops at goop.com and regulates her vaginal pH with crystals. <laughs> Yeah, Alice is a hippie cult lady is a strange turn, but I'm really into her wardrobe now. <laughs> Much more into it than I was before. I don't know what that says about me. I agree to disagree, but that's okay. <laughs> but we can't skip past the most important part of the scene is Polly offers Betty some milk oolong tea. And I mean, how great is it that we are getting more tea references? <laughs> it's like Reggie's still with us. Oh, oh, Betty, what? Come some milk oolong tea it's an incredible detoxifier oh we saw reggie last night and he was he looked so good and i'm just so happy for him what were you guys watching that he was in um the second movie in to all the boys i've loved before to all the boys p.s i still love you yes literally every every word you said this was like me making a cult reference (laughs) it is a book series that has been turned into a netflix movie series uh it's a trilogy and it's pretty charming it's pretty charming it has a like shy korean girl main character which is like a cool turn where it's the the author talked about wanting to make the the character that would be like the best friend the main character instead so reggie plays Uh, the main character no reggie plays uh, Reggie, basically. <laughs> oh he's, my god, um, yes. Like he a, he plays jock. the love interest of the main character's best friend. Yes. And remember, our main character is the person who would be the best friend of the star in a normal rom-com. Mm-hmm. Yes. So it completely makes sense. Yeah, no, he's a popular jock type who has a lot of funny one-liners, but doesn't have any real part to play. Mm. Well, he's Reggie. He seems like he's getting typecast. Yeah, but, but I'm he's into so it. good at it. <laughs> no, he was he was good on uh, what's the show? 
13 Reasons Why? Yeah. As Zach Butler. Why do I know the name and not the name of the show? I don't know. Yeah. He's the most memorable part of everything. Um, okay. <laughs> At the Cooper home, we also, for the first time, hear of Edgar and the farm. And Alice has been spending a lot of time with Edgar, so I already feel bad for the guy. I have to say, Edgar and the farm is also named my favorite <laughs> 60s psychedelic folk rock band. <laughs> Yeah, this is another thing that came out of nowhere where apparently there is a place called The Farm and there's some guy called Edgar who we've never seen or heard of before. <laughs> we still don't. He's completely off screen this whole episode. Yeah, but it'll be a good reveal, even if he's probably been revealed in the previous <laughs> season that we missed. <laughs> oh, Archie has a hot rod now. Yes. Yes, Archie and his dad also fix old cars now. Because mechanics and construction are the same thing. So, <laughs> sure. It's, they stole a good plot line from Home Improvement, like when Tim Taylor had the hot rod in the garage. <laughs> well, since Betty's the one who knows how to actually fix cars, I assume she's doing all the work and they're just sort of there. Taking credit. Taking credit. What kind of man would do that? <laughs> Taking credit for another woman's hard work. I don't know. It's not the story of my life or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's... um. I wanted to ask you, Hunter, like... This car felt like a little too purposeful to me. Is this a reference to something from the comics? This is not something that I bumped into in the comics, but I feel like, you know, I've maybe read between 10 and 20 Archie comics, and each of them has like four little mini stories. Okay. So I don't remember any car, like long running, like Archie's fixing a hot rod thing. <laughs> not so much the fix in the car, which is like, the specific design of the car seemed too, speci- uh, too like, I don't know. It, there was just something about it where it just called such attention to itself. I'm like, is this a reference? It might be. That's probably worth checking out. I mean, it seems like the right time period. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's like this, looks like a 1930s, 1940s chassis that they dropped like a whole new engine in and they really rotted it out. Luke Perry gets all upset and walks away once they get the car running, because he's thinking about Archie going to prison, which is still just a possibility. And I love this bit where Archie is like, Betty, if I go to jail, like, invite my dad over for dinner sometimes. Why? Why would you curse him with that? No one wants dinner at the <laughs> Cooper home. <laughs> Maybe he was trying to set up his dad with Betty. <laughs> I just think they could have changed it where it's like, Hey, like, if I'm gone, can you take my Luke Perry on walks? Listen to his <laughs> 90210 stories. Call him Pike every now scratch and him then. behind the flannel. <laughs> he likes that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because I'd rather let Buffalo Bill from, like, Silence of the Lambs lower me into a ditch than have dinner with Alice Cooper in that house. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a choice. Something happens with Veronica. We don't have Skip to discuss it. it. <laughs> don't care. <laughs> Theme for this, like this season, we're leaning in all the way. We're never discussing Veronica unless we have to. <laughs> or unless we have a really good insult for her. Yeah, let's get to what seems like it's the centerpiece of the show now. Gang warfare. <laughs> yeah, mm. of course. Yeah, Jughead's walking around with these like tank top flannel friends that look like they belong on the, gay- the cover of a gay teen erotica <laughs> that I would absolutely read. Hey, look, have you seen those Chuck Tingle books where he does the things like, yes. my holiday Starbucks cup turned me gay? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's what and the we- one in the blue flannel reminded me of Tom Welling in Smallville, and so I nicknamed him Smallville, and then they gave him a name, and I was like, God Is damn that the it. one that was like kind of shirtless? Ugh. No, that was the other one. Okay, the other one? Bangs. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, I nicknamed him Rock Man Body, and then <laughs> they called him Fangs, and I'm like, somehow that's even more gay erotica than what I was saying. Well, right. I nicknamed the one in the blue flannel Smallville, and then his real name is Sweet Pea. <laughs> Perfect gang member name. <laughs> All right. Just lean in. So... I didn't get this until I did a rewatch, but this whole weird tent city with these couches outside, they zoom out at one point and it's the trailer park where FP was living in season one, except now it has this banner like Home of the Serpents. So they've totally (laughs) taken over this place. It's so weird. Like the, in the first season, the serpents were like a fairly subdued, realistic gang of, you know, like small time petty crooks and drug dealers. And now it's like 
A high school led gang that's Hunger Games light about to engage in warfare where everyone has weapons, but no one has guns. Here's the thing that I was so thrown by. Like you said, season one, they were like a biker gang. And when we went in the White Worm, it was like a bunch of like tough guys in between the ages of 30 and 45. But now Jughead's giving orders. Like, is this a cadet branch of the serpents that he's running? <laughs> Where are all the adults? Why is FP just the tattoo artist for everyone now? I, I don't know. It's so confusing and weird. <laughs> did like, did every adult serpent get arrested? Except for FP who's like, you know what? I will snitch. Just no jail time for me, please. <laughs> I don't know, but FP has finally figured out beards, and I'm so proud of him. What a time to be alive. He looks better <laughs> this season. Oh, yeah. Well, he's just really happy now that I found his calling of tattooing shirtless boys, you know? <laughs> yeah, he looks great. But yeah, he gives Archie a stick-and-poke serpent tattoo, right, as Archie's talking about going swimming, which I don't think you should do right after you get a tattoo. That's a good way to get it infected. Especially not in a leech-infested lake. <laughs> yes. And I love it. Like they're talking about the possibility of Archie going to prison, and FP of all people gives him advice on staying sane. Yeah. I <laughs> I do love that they're like, by the way, Archie, this is literally the only way you would ever make friends with anyone. We have to trick people into thinking that you're cool. <laughs> they give him a serpent tattoo. FP like slaps him right on the tattoo at the end of the scene. <laughs> And Archie has a contender for cringiest line of the episode right out the gate when Jughead says, how does it feel to have your own serpent tattoo? And Archie says, pretty savage, Jug. <laughs> that was my cringiest line. How's it feel to be an honorary serpent? It was pretty savage, Jug. It was bad. <laughs> it's so bad. It's in, the, it's in my top three cringiest lines at the very least. Yeah. <laughs> but everything about this scene is so bizarre. Because we're just walking through a tent city, Jughead's in a wife beater giving orders to gang members. And how does he find time to like maintain his relationship with his girlfriend, run a gang, work on his writing, and go to school? Well, what we later learn is that Betty is the serpent queen. <laughs> She's in the gang too and co-runs it, which... You know, it's very progressive for the biker gang, but I just like, how did this happen? Hey, this is the same biker gang that was very, very cool with Joaquin being extremely out. I, I, I'm not, like, I, I'm just so confused. Like, <laughs> when did Betty get in the gang? When did she gain a prominent leadership position in the span of one semester? When did Cheryl get in the gang? Because we later see that she's a Southside serpent. Where's Cheryl's mom? We don't see Penelope anywhere. <laughs> There's so many questions. I hope none of them are answered. So but speaking of Betty, we cut back to the Cooper household, and Betty has learned literally nothing from season one because her mom is still easily finding and reading her diaries. Mom, what are you doing with my diaries? I was talking to Edgar about them, and he feels, and I agree, you should burn them. What are you talking about? Why? You've been filling these pages with so much pain and suffering over the years. You need to let that go. Yeah, I ta had this talk with Betty last season, and I told her to, like, use a word doc. It's really upsetting. Fire is always the solution, as Alice knows. Yeah. Because Edgar from the farm said it was a good idea, and cults that want to burn books are always known for being a positive force in the world. That's why it's called Fahrenheit 455. <laughs> cut that. Please cut that. <laughs> no, I'm going to put like echo on that or something. <laughs> or some sort of like featured. zing. Um, but yeah, and we learned how Cooper was apparently a serial killer. <laughs> what the fuck? Honestly, good for him. I'm glad he grew a backbone at some point. But <laughs> what a turn. I mean, Alice must be more into him than ever. He finally stepped up. <laughs> like all simple plan fans something was deeply wrong with him <laughs> all right who did he serial kill because i'm actually thinking penelope's absence means that hal murdered the shit out of her i i wonder if he was the person who shot luke perry like was that the setup or was that something oh, else like how many murderers were there running around last season because we also get a line about someone named Chick, who was apparently also a killer. 
And we know Andre Smithers shot someone, so who did what is really up in the and air. And Andre Smithers shot some guy named Cassidy. But not the Sundance Kid, so. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I'm so lost, but it's the first, like, Betty has some line of, oh yeah, this cult for wives of serial killers, which was the first time that we'd heard anything about Hal being a serial killer. So this really floored me. What a specific cult. <laughs> like, you're really lowering your membership numbers there. Ooh, you're not a wife of a serial killer, and you're not a pregnant teen? Yikes. Better I, mean, out. I feel like you could build a solid cult out of pregnant teen runaways. I feel like there's a good number of people there. But wives of serial killers, that's... I feel like that's a pretty small support club. It is. We've also had this thing of... Betty had an internship working for Molly Ringwald doing legal stuff, and she's been taking a lot of Adderall. And then at the end of this scene, Polly decides to snitch on her sister again, <laughs> which is a Seriously, Polly, Polly is the worst. I hate her. She's pretty bad. I also don't understand this whole idea of like, oh, she was self-medicating with Adderall. Maybe she should see a therapist instead. Like, that's not what Adderall does. That's like being like, maybe I should stop taking cocaine and see a therapist. Like, those are both good things to do, but one does not replace the other in any way. No. It's not like she's taking Xanax. <laughs> Thank God, Xanax is pretty fucking dangerous. It is. That's why I stick with Zoloft. You guys, this episode is sponsored by Zoloft. <laughs> Isn't that what Little Peep died from, like Xanax and something else? You know, I hear the words you're saying, but it's they don't form a real sentence in my head. Ambien is often involved in celebrity deaths, too. Jeez. Okay, uh, yeah, before we go down that rabbit hole, where are we? Are we at the pool party? <gasps> I think, I think now we we're are. at the pool party. Oh my god, yes! We get the pool party, and holy shit, I feel like you guys, I probably have a million things to say about this. <laughs> Yes, the rest of the episode will just be this pool party. <laughs> we could spend it like half an hour on this. We'll try not to, but there's a lot here. I already pointed out the terrible heels that Cheryl's wearing. That I, yeah. And then I guess Smallville and Josie are a thing. And I just, I really never thought that she would give him a chance. So I'm so surprised. I mean, I also didn't know he existed until two minutes ago, but I just never thought those two crazy kids would work it out. I thought that whole thing with them was so funny. Just like, excuse you, we can't continue doing whatever we're doing. I have to focus on my music. And it's like, you're a high school junior. <laughs> you're already regionally famous. I think you can slow down just enough to have a sexy fling. But nothing, not even a tall, cool drink sweet water like you it's gonna distract me from my music if jughead can run an entire gang and maintain a very strong relationship with betty i think you can have a band and a boyfriend josie like well, you're not even betty the songwriter giving him a lot of adderall to feel that <laughs> that's how he's able to have it all hey that actually that's a pretty good theory so yeah i didn't even know who this kid was and it's just like, Josie, we've really developed a beautiful budding relationship. And I was like, this, could, this guy could be anyone. I wouldn't be surprised if this was also the first time he was introduced. Like if everybody just forgot to establish him. <laughs> we have this aside where Kevin and Moose are basking poolside reading a book. Apparently they're friends. And that's where Kevin brings up that line of, we should make a pact to lose our virginity, which seems so out of place in the context of this entire episode's gang warfare and occult drama. But my... it's important to establish that Kevin wants that moose dick. Yeah. <laughs> my, my guess is I, they are dating now, apparently, um, which was a weird way to set that up. Uh, I, maybe they set it up earlier. Moose looks but... uncomfortable when Kevin says, let's make a pact to lose our virginity. And my theory is Moose is too polite to tell Kevin that he already lost his virginity back in freshman year. And he just wants to play <laughs> along so like he can support Kevin and make sure his friend doesn't feel bad. Yes, frankly, it is surprising that Kevin has not already lost his virginity. Um, yeah, what I saw of season two involved him doing a lot of like cruising in the park, which was a huge issue because the Betty kept being like, you're going to die because there's a serial killer out there. And why are you going to meet strange men in the park to have sex with them? 
So I'm confused. Yeah, and he and Joaquin were already, like, they dated for the better part of season one. But again, that was, what, like, two weeks in Riverdale time. Yeah, true. But I mean, like, the first thing he did when Mushem's dick is, like, let's go skinny dipping. So it seems like Kevin moves pretty quickly. Yeah, he seemed like he was very experienced because in episode one, when they were going down to Sweetwater River to skinny dip, Kevin's like, ooh, I love a good closet case, implying that, like, he's kind of hooked up with guys who were confused about their sexuality before, implying mm. experience. <sighs> hey, who knows? This Kevin character is who just knows? not getting treated consistently, but even worse, there's an imposter Reggie. Oh, I, uh. I, I know we only got, like, two lines from him, but he is no Ross Butler. <laughs> You're not my real Reggie. <laughs> One of his lines is a cringe line. Yeah. When Archie's telling him, oh, uh, you got to run the bulldogs and keep them out of trouble and stop them from starting another gang war. New Reggie says that bloody chapter's over. And I can only imagine that the writers wrote this thinking that they were going to cast a British Reggie and it was going to be <laughs> that bloody chapter's over. <laughs> because <laughs> without that it just seems like something no one would ever say <laughs> no yeah i i so new reggie is very attractive because of course it's a show for the cw and he's got like cheekbones that can cut glass but <laughs> but i hate him already he looks <laughs> a lot more like a one-dimensional douchebag whereas ross butler just had like a way more amiable quality to his acting. But yeah, Sarah, can you elaborate on what makes Ross Butler such a heartthrob? Everything. Um, it's that he seems like an actual person. It's pretty simple, really. There's just something likable about him despite his douchiness. And the moment that we find out that Cheryl's Tony is her girlfriend. Please, call her TT. He saved my life, TT. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. But only after taking a long pause before finishing the sentence in which you would you address her as TT. <laughs> TT Kins. Oh God! <laughs> I just imagine if OG Reggie was here, uh, he would have had one of two reactions to finding out that Cheryl is a lesbian. One is he would cry a single misogynistic <laughs> tear because he no longer has a chance to, as he would say, tap that ass. And he would post that whole story to Instagram. <laughs> the other option would be he would be really excited and try and figure out some way he could watch them making out. That's what the real <laughs> Reggie would do. <laughs> yes, this Reggie looks like he would be like, are you really sure you're a lesbian? <laughs> because you haven't had my dick yet. And like, I bet it could change your mind. <laughs> this Reggie is awful and I hate him. This guy sucks. Replace him again. Yeah. Get Ross Butler back. Um, but more importantly, Veronica makes a plan to tamper with Archie's jury, but uh, that goes nowhere. <laughs> of course. This is not a case that would be sequestered also. Like, I don't understand why they're acting like this is, like, international news. <laughs> it's not. So she's trying to get there to be a hung jury? Is that Veronica's plan? Yeah. But we also learn that she didn't need to do anything because it's a hung jury anyway. And that's none of this. Okay, I've bid on a hung jury. That is none of this is how it went. Very inaccurate. I hated this whole plot. Line. I don't know. It's totally stupid. But thankfully, at this pool party, we have another. I think this might have been my cringiest line. When mm. what's the guy's name? Fangs. <laughs> yes, yeah, Fangs. The, the perfect way to set up tension at the end of this like cool small scale get together. He runs up and says. It's the ghoulies, Jughead. Those bastards have hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> and a line that's supposed to be taken seriously. <laughs> We've done it, everyone. It's the perfect, most dramatic line ever uttered in film or television. Yep, the ghoulies stole a hot dog, and they're just relishing this victory. <laughs> it's time for the serpents to catch up. <laughs> the hideout will be crowded, <laughs> and they'll need to muster I, I am it stopping up. stopping here. <laughs> this is getting obscene. <laughs> Oh my god, this is what Sarah spent all of her note time on. These puns. Oh. No, that only took a second. Can we just <laughs> move Dijon from this? Yeah, these puns were, were a little too cheesy. You need to chilly out a little. <laughs> Don't poop on my work. <laughs> oh. So, we find out that these ghoulies, these unseen ghoulies, must have snatched Hot Dog on riot night. 
The serpents are just now figuring this out. How did they not notice the dog was missing sooner? Were they just like, oh yeah, I thought he was on vacation. He usually goes to Turks and Caicos every summer. <laughs> They're terrible pet owners. You would notice like yes. the same day if your dog was gone. It's a weird plot line, especially because, all right, so obviously as like a dog owner, like the idea that people are mistreating dogs like infuriates me, but... In terms of gang warfare, this seems pretty mild. We stole your dog and we are underfeeding it. Also, how do they know that Hot Dog looks skinny? The dog is a mop. <laughs> like, I don't understand. They haven't been shampooing him regularly. <laughs> but that's where I find out that everyone but Veronica is a serpent, and they're ready to go to war because, and I quote, Betty, the serpent queen, is a warrior queen. The serpent queen is a warrior queen. So if you're on the front lines, so am I. <laughs> and Jughead looks at her like, you sure are my serpent queen. Now let me show you my serpent peen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's the part where Betty says, we've got to do this fast or whatever. And Jughead's like, Betty, I am, I am always fast. You know that. <laughs> That's actually one of my lingering questions. Have Betty and Jughead finally consummated their relationship? I would love to know that as well. They were broken up when I stopped watching, which is honestly why. That was the final straw for me, where I was like, garbage. I hate this show now. Bye. The makeup bang is in the top five bangs. So I'm sure <laughs> when they got back together, there was just that wild torrent of affection. And you can't be the serpent queen if you haven't slept with the serpent king. Yeah, that's that makes fair. sense. Making it canon, they fucked. <laughs> So skipping over the jury tampering. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Veronica goes to the Radisson, which is about as exciting as the Radisson. <laughs> I do like, there were a few like random lines that came up. So <laughs> Veronica says something like, you do not deserve to be framed for murder. I just had to point out the jury is literally still out on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Archie sa says that uh, he doesn't want his parents working on that anymore. He's like, you guys are the best parents anyone could ask for. And I wanted to follow up. Mom, you're kind of the worst attorney, though. I might be found guilty, and you're charging me a full rate? I'm your son. <laughs> oh, and there's a new sheriff in town. Literally. Sheriff Manetta. So they came to their senses and fired Keller because he's completely <laughs> incompetent. I like this new guy already. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and Keller is still around for some reason. I'm not sure what he does now. I think he's just Luke Perry's wingman. Not sure. <laughs> he's a private eye now. <laughs> he's sharecropper Keller. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, but Mineta seems actually confident. He's like, well, I got a tip off you might be here, so I figured it made sense to apprehend you at the scene of the crime. And Keller's like, whoa, what? how'd you think of that? You can do that? <laughs> That's allowed? <laughs> you can, like, think ahead? Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, my God. This explains so many things. <laughs> so on to the... Uh... <laughs> The sting operation to recover hot dog. <laughs> this is where this episode goes way off the rails. <laughs> you know what, though? I loved this. Maybe I've been playing too much Fallout, but I loved how, like, Jughead walks into the scene to get hot dog, and then immediately there's, like, spotlights and all these gang members come out, and it seemed like I was, like, playing some kind of raider hideout in Fallout. That is yes. exactly how it felt. There it's is... like you trigger the mechanism where all of a sudden there's a million enemies in the room and you're like, oh. There crap. is a quality of this that's so like, I don't know, like weirdly uh, dystopian. Like the ghoulies look like literally every punk gang in like a trashy futuristic movie. Mm -hmm. They look like they're out of Mad Max because they're carrying like saw blade weapons and one of them looks like he has a hook for a hand or something <laughs> yeah. And they, yeah they're all like punked out and wearing beetlejuice stripes and all these things what happened to gangs having like knives and guns and baseball bats <laughs> no they, chainsaws and pitchforks yeah i don't know it's the most obvious trap set up ever when they stake out where hot dogs tied up and Seeing this obvious trap, Jughead says, yeah, I should go in. <laughs> and of course, yeah, the ghoulies swarm out and there's a confrontation. And I think we all saw it coming when, you know, Cheryl shot a guy with a longbow. <laughs> yes. Uh, that, uh, really, that was the obvious place this was going to go. They just telegraphed that the whole, to us the whole time. Yeah, she's a superhero now. Sure, she's why Katniss. not? Katniss. I don't know. This is so weird. Some guy steps towards Jughead 
and Cheryl unleashes an arrow into his like chest slash shoulder and he goes down like a ton of bricks. This is bizarre. I mean, I haven't seen any of these characters before, but Penny, the leader of the ghoulies, is kind of badass. Yeah, I, b- I believe you actually have something for us about Cheryl's bow and arrow skills. Yeah, so the thing is, like we were talking about, this whole gang confrontation seems reminiscent of other gang confrontations we've seen. Turns out there's like a little scene they did that was an homage to other gang confrontations that I have the audio from. <sighs> Boy. That escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. It jumped up a notch. It did, didn't it? I told you I was in the mood for some hell raising. I saw that. Cheryl. Killed a guy. We're celebrating with an epic end of summer pool party at Thornhill. I've been meaning to talk to you about that. You should find yourself a safe house or a relative close by. Lay low for a while because you're probably wanted for murder. <laughs> they never addressed that she shot a guy with an arrow. It, and her, her, she apparently never misses, which I don't know how they know that. Has she been murdering people <laughs> with arrows like all of season two? I don't know. This is a wild turn of events. And she must be superhuman because Hunter, you uh, did archery for a while and you were impressed that Cheryl was able to hold a bow at full draw for like a full minute. There's no way to do that if it's not like a toy bow because a hunting bow has like 40 to 50 pound draw weight. And she has a recurve bow, so that's tension's always on you. There's no way even like a champion bowman could have held up the bow at full draw for that period of time. Cheryl is bionic. Uh, that is something else that happened in season two. She has super strength, <laughs> and I'm okay with this. <laughs> I do want to point out like a few just sillier lines on top of all that. Uh, as Jughead just tries to like get it, it was like, well, I have hot dog now, so I guess i'll be moseying on over here and he does the slowest saunter of all time penny goes not so fast (laughs) not so moderately paced (laughs) we also learn that the south side serpents no longer control the south side and there's a line that betty is the north side queen so they are now the north side south side serpents which it gets confusing the geography here is a little muddled is the trailer park tent city on the south side of town or the north side? <laughs> I bet there's just even more confusion there that's like the east side. <laughs> what about Midtown? <laughs> but uh, so this actually reminded me of there's a pretty great joke in this internet series called Dragon Ball Z A Bridge that's also about confusing directions. So, uh, Hunter, if you could play that. The south side isn't yours anymore. Ponytail's a serpent now, your north side queen. So South City is to the north, North City is to the west, and East City is... also to the north. Where the f*** am I? Hey you, I want to make a joke about your team. What's its name? The East City Westmen! (laughs) (laughs) So I think East City Westmen is about on par with the North Side, South Side Serpents. But Penny gets very upset over this and is like, you shouldn't call yourselves the South Side Serpents anymore. Because we're on the south side. And when Jughead tries to argue, her response is, well, now the north side's fair game. We're going to take it over. But then we'll probably also have to change our name. Meanwhile, Dilton Doily's compass is just furiously spinning. (laughs) I have to say, I was on Penny's side linguistically up until she went and was like, now that you guys have taken back your dog from us, I guess we've got to attack the north side. I was like, no, no, you had a strong argument that they shouldn't be the South Side Serpents, but I, I'm not sure why you're getting revenge on them just kind of harmlessly taking back their own dog. Yeah, Cheryl kind of went off the hook with <laughs> killing a man. This gives me a really good hypothesis, which is that Hot Dog is the Gargoyle King. <laughs> <laughs> My God, he is, he is the Allspark. <laughs> he is the power behind this. Yes. This explains so much. After this, I think there's some shot where, like, Archie has bad dreams. Yes, it's so weird. It just randomly cuts to Archie, like, panting, running through the woods and people screaming. And it's so confusing that for a couple seconds, I was like, wow, the ghoulies are pursuing them through the woods. Oh, no, wait, Archie is here? But he wasn't, oh, this is something else. Okay. Yes. And then he copes with it by rubbing one out. 
And by that, I mean polishing his hot rod. And by that, I mean he's cleaning his car. <laughs> I will give the show this. Their cinematography has gotten a lot better. Like, yes. this actually felt like it could have been shot for, like, a movie or something. There was a lot of atmospheric dread. The cutting it into where it was cut was odd and confusing, but at least it looked great. Yeah. No, the show is actually really well shot. And I think the editing is, for the most part, better than it was in season one. Although, like you said, this was a strange couple of scenes to cut between because we have nighttime wood scene and then cut to totally different nighttime wood scene. Yeah, they just needed to intercut like Archie writhing in bed with his eyes closed and then we can pretty easily intuit, oh, this is just Archie having a nightmare. Then FP and Jughead have a little discussion about how, hey, we just started a gang war. (laughs) So this is a problem i'm so far having with the gang war there isn't really a talk about the economics of like what do the ghoulies do like do they run drugs if so if this is a gang war like go after their dealers and like try and cut off their supply of money or like you need to have friends on the police to keep yourselves out of trouble when things start getting violent but it seems like they're kind of treating this gang war very lightly and in a very juvenile manner yeah, that's the weird thing about all of this. The gang war is so prominent. But, but I don't understand so any weight. of there it. There has to be something more at stake than, oh, we don't like that you're called the Southside Serpents anymore. That we're going to have a war. There should be some sort of economic drive because gangs are kind of like businesses. And there need to be a reason to be in competition. Or like you can do what West Side Story did. It's like, we're just racist against each other. That makes sense. (laughs) Ghoulies hate serpents. Everyone knows that. (laughs) It's tied into the fabric of America. (laughs) That would make sense. In Veronica Mars, it's that the PCH and the Fitzpatricks are both fighting over the same like drug line, basically, which makes sense. And racism, you know, Irish and, uh, you know. We can find no shortage of TV shows where, like, this plot line has been done competently. Like, Breaking Bad had not even a season, like, just one episode dedicated to, like, the fallout of the gang wars now that Walter White is dealing drugs and other people don't like it. Yeah, we could have something like that, but we're not really given a reason why these two gangs are in conflict. Maybe because the serpent is historically a satanic symbol. Uh, actually, the ghoulies are evangelical Christians, and they... <laughs> <laughs> That's my best explanation at this point, because the show has provided nothing better. Oh, then we get back to the Cooper house, where Alice is still... She's toned down. She's less severe. She's finally at peace with herself and with others. It's very creepy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. It feels wrong. Uh, we find out Betty's forging her Adderall prescriptions. This would be so difficult to pull off, though. Like, that's a Schedule 1 drug. They, like, track how much you personally have taken out of that drug. That's what I thought. I figured there'd be some sort of controls, but because Uh I've never had a prescription like that, I couldn't speak competently on it. Betty mentions that Hal killed four people. Oolong milk and wanting to burn my diaries is helping you get over the fact that Dad murdered four people and tried to kill us. And Polly instantly responds like, this is the first time you've talked about him in months. But earlier in the episode, she's like, oh yeah, blah, 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 mom, wife of a serial killer. So that's kind of not really <laughs> true. Well, you see, Polly doesn't really understand how reference work. So when she's like, wife of a serial killer, who is serial killer in this <laughs> sentence? <laughs> Polly just wasn't there for that conversation. And she assumes that if she didn't hear it, It didn't happen. (laughs) Polly does look like she wouldn't understand object permanence. (laughs) Yeah. Her babies are figuring it out, but she's still like, ah. She turns around, just got to get some food for, oh, no, I don't have children anymore. I've got to go to my, oh, they're back. I guess the tension is Polly and Alice are really pressuring Betty to get into the cult. I guess. And by that, I mean Edgar on the farm, not the 1980s rock band. I don't know exactly where... (laughs) This whole Betty forging Adderall prescriptions and possibly having a drug addiction is going. Me neither. But I like Jughead putting his hat on Betty. That's cute. Oh, when they go and they have like the really cute moment at the fireside. Mm -hmm. Very sweet. Yeah. A few notes leading up to that. This is KJ Apple's like fifth or sixth shirtless scene this uh, episode. He is just never going to wear a shirt again. Oh, I wonder if shirts are optional in prison. (laughs) 
And uh, Veronica looks like she's ready to star in Thelma and Louise. She's got like a little bonnet and dark sunglasses. She's riding by his side. Yeah, they're in the hot rod. And I had my note on that where Veronica's headscarf in the passenger seat looks more like a Russian babushka than Catherine Hepburn. (laughs) (laughs) It's not an elegant look. I didn't notice it till the second watch because my eyes refused to see Veronica. And I was like, Betty and Jughead look so cute together riding on the rumble seat. Sarah and I were also really baffled when they make it to the swim hole scene because they go swimming in their underwear. And it's just so weird to me because, like, they went out to deliberately come swimming. Why would they not bring swimsuits? And if it's supposed to be, like, titillating, like, oh, they're going in their underwear, you could pretty easily change it to be, like, oh, no, they're really skinny dipping. We just, like... We're not panning to what we can't show. Like, bathing suits are more revealing than the underwear they're wearing, so this is so weird all around as, like, a specific design choice. I didn't think of that, but you're absolutely right. They knew they were going to the swimming hole. They would have worn swimsuits under their clothes. This also isn't really a swimming hole. Like, this is the kind of place that would be called, like, first dam or second dam or something, because it's clearly a river dam. And it has this random sign, caution, no swimming after Labor Day, which <laughs> is not a sign that exists. Right. I was anywhere. like, why, why would that exist in the real world? I know it's like to remind us viewers like, oh, Archie might not be free after this weekend. But like in the world of the show, what would this sign accomplish? Labor Day is when the crocodile's gone. <laughs> <laughs> right after Labor Day, they just dump a bunch of poison into all the ponds. <laughs> That's when they restock on the leeches. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was really strange. But when they get to the swimming hole and they're all undressing, Archie says last one in gets a sticky maple. And Veronica jumps in last. And I feel like she lingers purposefully. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. She wants I it. I know what's happening on Archie's last night as a free man. Mm-hmm. Well, you have to understand, his perfect last day involves sticky mapling Veronica. <laughs> So we do have this scene after they go swimming where they have a little campfire and I believe this ties into your geography when Jughead suggests that Archie run to Quebec. Past that tree line is a road that goes through the mountains to Quebec. Chug it. There's serpents north of the border that'll keep you supplied. Because there's a Canadian Southside Serpent faction there. (laughs) Like what? We are really stretching the definition of South Side. If you keep going north, there's a whole lot more South Side serpents. (laughs) Anything south of Santa is South Side. Actually, uh, the North Pole is the South Side serpent base of operation. (laughs) Clearly. (laughs) Is the South Side just a prefix? Like there's also like a Quebecois serpents? I'm sure there's a South Side to Quebec the city because most cities have South Sides. But it's just so confusing. Like, it seems like you're really limiting your uh, your ability to be a successful international gang if you're always limited to the south side of whatever city you sign up in. Yeah, the city borders a, is just north of a lake. There's no south side. Yeah. Like Detroit, right? Detroit has no south side. I gotta be honest, I'm not familiar with the geography of Detroit. <laughs> All right. I know Chicago doesn't have an east side. Yeah, and I think Detroit, like, because there's the Journey song, like, Born and Raised in South Detroit. Yes, okay, yes, you're right. I do know that's a factual And error. there's no south side of Detroit, so it's just a weird line. But I think this is what you're talking about, Sarah, where Jughead and Betty have a really, really cute scene at the campfire. Yeah, It's adorable. Yes, they're still why, like, they're the good part of the show. There are other good parts now. But, I mean, they're the good, consistent part of the show. Absolutely, because, like, it's touching. They have these cute details, like Jughead putting his beanie on her and kind of saying, like, oh, we're partners in life. It just gives you, like, a good, warm feeling. Mm -hmm. They have this weird thing called chemistry, which maybe maybe other couples on the show should get some. (laughs) Archie and Veronica. This scene hurt me on a lot of levels. It's bad all around. I mean, oof. I hate Archie's stupid warped sense of guilt. Like, I accidentally got someone killed. I better go to jail for this. I could have killed somebody, but didn't. Like, technically, isn't that true of every human being? (laughs) (laughs) Like, we could do that, but we don't. So it's fine. He doesn't make any sense. The first time he tries to do something smart in this entire series is he tries to break up with Veronica before going to prison. (laughs) 
And then he fails miserably at that. <laughs> Which is on brand for Archie. Veronica's like, I'm going to be a prison widow. And I, I had to give that a very firm, settle down. This is your high school boyfriend. I did the math. You two have been together nine months. <laughs> yeah. She's real tied to him. And she's like, I'm going to visit every week and bring you cupcakes. And I want him to be like, you're going to make me look like a bitch in front of all the other guys. <laughs> Bring me hustlers and cartons of cigarettes. <laughs> and somehow that leads to the dumbest line of them all. Archie's fears that he, not that he doesn't worry that he'll get shivved in prison. He worries he won't be able to graduate with them. The thing that keeps me up most nights isn't that I might get shivved. It's that I won't be able to graduate with you guys. Yeah, that's what's important in life. <laughs> this is my question, and it's like a grammatical or syntactical thing. He says he's not worried about getting shivved in prison. I thought it was a thing where, like, you got shanked with a shiv and you didn't get shivved with a shiv. Or am I totally wrong? Like, I thought, like, you get stabbed with a sword, you don't get sorted. <laughs> I, I think you're right. <laughs> uh, you might be right, although then you do sit shiva. <laughs> <laughs> then, like, you get knifed with a knife, so maybe you do get shivved with a shiv. I just wanted more time of, like, Archie studying, like, Prison terms for dummies. <laughs> <laughs> Watching that Will Ferrell, Kevin Hart movie get hard and taking notes. I will shake. He did shake. <laughs> we sh don't. We. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> <They> shonk. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think you are right, but I, I don't know enough to be certain. And I actually did volunteer at a juvenile detention center for... A number of months so i mean obviously don't want to wind up there but it's not a super dangerous setting you go to juvenile detention centers because the state believes you can be rehabilitated but yeah i have also done some slp work in a juvenile detention center and yeah they were really sweet kids if you're really scary. dangerous i wasn't scared right if you're <laughs> so. really dangerous they push for you to go to prison right they decide you're an adult if they think you're really dangerous because that's how time works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't have any experience with it, but the way they have this all set up where Archie's really worried and they have him on this like bus going down a dusty road at the end, I expected it to be like, you're in a chain gang now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there are like classrooms and like, it's not... Not like how they are seeming to portray it. <laughs> it's not Prison Junior. <laughs> no. It's a Supermax <laughs> Juvenile Detention Center. <laughs> they named the Juvenile Detention Center after like some of the worst serial killers in history. Oh, jeez, I didn't know The this. Leopold and Loeb Detention Center. It's like, that's an odd choice. Lisa Loeb, of course. <laughs> famous <laughs> songwriter and serial killer. <laughs> yeah, you didn't know Stay was about like pinning someone to the ground with a knife. <laughs> Why won't you stay? <laughs> You say, please don't kill me. <laughs> Skipping forward a little bit, Archie does at the end of this episode get sent off to prison. I want the next thing, next episode to open with them like fitting some sort of muzzle or mask on him, and he's full Bane at this point. <laughs> that would be amazing. Hello, when, Veronica. <laughs> when we get back to the courtroom, the jury is hung, so they're dismissed, and there's going to be mistrial. But the DA offers Archie a plea deal which he immediately accepts on the logic that I can't put everyone through this again. But the thing people were worried about and want to go through again was the possibility of you going to jail. This is just skipping to the part they're worried about. His family is not like, oh, yippee, it's solved. <laughs> that's, that's not how that works. <laughs> yeah, because his dad's response is, we're going to work tirelessly to find a way to get you out of there. So you're not saving your family any trouble. Right. You also cannot appeal a plea deal. That's why it's a plea deal. Mm -hmm. Oh, sh I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, he's admitted to guilt now. He screwed himself over majorly. I did think that was a bad call when he's like, I'm going to admit guilt for two years. When, as we learned earlier, this is a murder where there were no witnesses that can confirm Archie did it, and there's no gun, and there's no forensic evidence that ties him to this murder. He decides to plead guilty and gets sent off to prison immediately, still in his bow tie. And meanwhile, Dilton Doily had corn Jughead, and, been, and he was like, it's real, it's all real. And Jughead, like a normal person, goes, I've got a thing, and I don't really know what you're talking about, so... 
Maybe just sit here and I'll get back to you whenever it's convenient. Tilton Thorley is a different character every time he appears. <laughs> Who, yeah, think about he was survivalist, adventure scout, gun enthusiast, DJ, and now he's like a nerdy RPG <laughs> kid. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> But apparently it took Jughead like five hours to go from court to get back to his house because he leaves Dilton Zoily in the early afternoon. And when he comes back, it is full dark outside. Full dark. There no are stars. no stars. <laughs> <laughs> Were you already going for that reference? Yes. Yes, I was. God, I'm <laughs> sorry. It's okay. It's even better that you, you know, that we know each other well enough. Uh, it's like he said full dark. That was a thing before. Totally. <laughs> Dylan Doyle though says the gargoyle king is real. Will was taken into the upside down and wait, what show is this? <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Like they really just cribbed Stranger Things for this, especially with the tabletop RPG kind of blending or tying back to the supernatural plot, which made more sense in Stranger Things because it just gave the kids a name to call this creature. And it wasn't exclusively tied to a board game, which is Yeah, it was silly. a very believable thing where, like, there's a monster. We don't know what to call it, but we're kids who play board games, so let's name it after one of the monsters we think is scary. Like, this makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. They didn't go for subtle or believable or clever in Riverdale. They went for, yeah. <laughs> fuck it, there's a gargoyle king. Do we know what that means? Nah. Dilton no. leaves behind a creepy map that Jughead just immediately figures out, and then he goes and finds Ben and Dilton's prone bodies at, like, a satanic altar. Yeah, it's like sort of like someone's doing a satanic panic frame-up job, which would have been very effective in the 80s and 90s, but we're kind of on to that whole thing now as not being real. It's weird, but they've got runes carved into their back so i guess they like took turns carving each other's backs before they drank what looks like blue gatorade that's in chalices <laughs> and it was apparent, apparently spiked because dilton doily is unresponsive and ben starts like choking up broth and he looks like he's possibly alive and we leave on jughead screaming for help and then we close on, by far, a much stronger ending. Uh, <laughs> Betty just, like, watching her mom and sister stand around a campfire. Dude, so is this, like, in the Cooper backyard where they have a bonfire? I, I don't know. Guess? And she's just like, oh, yeah, it's Tuesday. Let's throw some babies onto this fire. But the babies fly. Yes, there are floating babies, which I'm going to be so upset if this was a drug-induced deep dream because I want this to be real. I do too. Like they go to drop the babies in the fire. The babies magically float on air. So Betty faints and has a seizure. Where did this come from? Why did she suddenly go into a seizure? Is this supposed to be drug related? I think so. I think that's the implication though. I have to be honest. Did we see her take any drugs this episode? Like we know she had drugs because of the dialogue, but did we also, see her take I, anything? No, I really don't think seizure. I mean, you would have to take so much Adderall to have a seizure from it. And I don't think that's what... I think you just have a heart attack first. <laughs> like, I don't think that's really how that works. Well, you know, because film is a visual form first, and the most powerful thing to do is to put images on screen, rather than show Betty taking a lot of Adderall and kind of getting frayed around the edges, they just have her talk calmly about it. As one does when really high. Especially on Adderall. Just... A drug which is notable for its calming effects. <laughs> I mean, it does have a calming effect if you have ADHD. <laughs> I mean, not in really high amounts, though. Yeah. And she talks to Jughead about how all summer she's practically hasn't slept. But they don't make Betty visually look like they didn't do a full season one Skeet Ulrich job on her where they make her look like she's falling apart physically. She still looks <laughs> no, gorgeous. No, she didn't have any five o'clock shadow at all. So. <laughs> I meant like, you know, like the dark yeah. circles under her eyes, but five o'clock shadow also. Just looks looking a little shabby and, you know, like a little haggard, something to indicate, oh, I am going through something and am not a gorgeous 11 out of 10 woman who looks basically perfect. Mm -hmm. It didn't have to be a massive change. They didn't have to make her look disgusting, but even her going from super pristine to just like, oh, she's dressing differently and, like, wearing her hair differently would have been enough to show that there's something changed in Betty. 
Yeah. It's weird, but hey, we got babies floating over fire. We got a dramatic ending where Betty faints and has a seizure. And then they say, let's roll credits. What a great episode. <laughs> so good. It's fantastic. Um, uh, one, could you want you guys do the wrap up? I, I kind of boiled it down pretty small. Sure. Sure. Uh, Archie is in jail now because, as always, he's a ding dong. Hiram is a dick. Magic is real as our demons. Jughead is involved in a gang war. And did I mention magic is real? <laughs> Cheryl killed a guy. <laughs> Cheryl is a superhero. <laughs> Shot a man in the heart with an arrow. That was holy shit. So we usually do predictions here. But since we <laughs> also skipped a season, maybe we should also take a stab at the dark uh, in both directions and ask, what do you guys think happened in season two that we missed? Okay. Post dictions? So I do yes. have, yeah, post dictions about what happened to uh, Sheriff Keller and Mayor McCoy. Um, I figure once Hiram got out, he somehow made Sheriff Keller and Mayor McCoy look incompetent. I know, I know. It seems like a stretch that that would be something someone could do. And then ran his own lackey to become sheriff and put his wife in a position of power as the mayor. Because we do find out Hermione is the mayor now. In like a quick aside, she answers the oh, phone and says, I Mayor totally Lodge speaking. That. I missed it too. <laughs> oh, wow. So that's my prediction for what happened there. Um, a post-diction. <laughs> uh... Yeah, I think that Betty's half-brother was one of the killers. Oh. That would make sense. Or is it full brother? Since it's... Yeah. I do, we, we don't know. It's implied that it's Hal yeah. and Alice. But we don't know for sure. But, <laughs> yeah. So my thing was, I thought, is Ben the brother? Because he hmm. just came so far out of nowhere and he was this blonde guy. Blonde, clean cut guy. I'm like, maybe that's Betty's secret brother. I'll it be honest, kind of over the course of this recording, I've already forgotten who Ben is. <laughs> <laughs> He's the other one. He's Tilton's friend. The other thing was, who the fuck did Hal kill? I have two ideas, Penelope and Andre Smithers, since this Andre dude they talk about is nowhere to be seen and doesn't seem like he was questioned in the murder. So he's got to be dead, too. Yeah. Is Hal dead? I feel like probably. No. No, that can't be right. What if Archie, somehow there's new evidence, Archie gets retried as an adult, and he and Hal end up as bunkmates in prison? <laughs> Whoa, amazing. Like, I'm guessing Hal hung himself on the same beam as his third, second cousin? <laughs> I don't know. It could be. It's also a crazy twist that he not only murdered four people, but also is a wannabe family annihilator. Like, he tried to kill the whole family. I really want to know what happened there. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but this is great. How he really jumped up a notch in season two. <laughs> he really swung for the fences. And that was heartwarming to hear that he was so involved in the plot. Yeah, that laugh that, that Alice, when Alice laughed at the idea that he could be a killer, that was a real turning point in his life. <laughs> I'll he show her. Act together. I'll kill My the head. shit out of people. My big prediction is we will abandon Riverdale entirely. This is going to become like Oz now, and we're just going to follow Archie's daily life in prison. My hope was that we just weren't going to get any Archie until he gets released <laughs> from prison, and that this show would increase in quality. <laughs> it would be great. Because <laughs> then Veronica would have no reason to hang out with Betty and Jughead. So Ver we could cut Veronica too. Like, they seem to have cut Kevin out of the group pretty easily. He didn't go swimming with them. True. Yeah. Yeah, I think for the next few episodes, Veronica should just try really hard to build a tunnel to the prison. <laughs> and you can just cut to that occasionally and uh, for like two seconds and then go back to what's actually happening. It's just her in a hard hat with a pickaxe <laughs> below ground. Exactly. My prediction is Betty's going to get captured by this cult and held at the farm. And yeah, that sounds right. Jughead's going to have to go looking for her and he's going to think it's the ghoulies and it's going to escalate the gang war, but really... Oh, maybe he's going to need to enlist the help of the ghoulies. Hey, mending fences. My other prediction is Dilton's going to be just fine because he's a survivalist. So he's <laughs> very hard to kill. Totally. He's got so many canned goods. <laughs> can't, can't, can't get to him. He's got a fortress. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if he was a kid who's like, I've been taking small amounts of poison for ages. <laughs> yes. I was immune to the arsenic. <laughs> I shoot myself with an arrow every day. <laughs> I mean, we saw last season with Ethel's dad that, hey, people in this world can just take a whole bunch of poison and, oh, they're good. They'll be fine. 
So any predictions on your end, Sarah? Nope. All right. In that case, some cringy lines, perhaps, like milk oolong tea is an incredible (laughs) detoxifier. (laughs) That was a line. I missed that one. Yeah, that's when that's when Polly first sees Betty. (laughs) And no tall drink of cool water is going to distract me from my music. Oh, that one was really bad. I forgot. That was Josie talking to Sweet Pea at poolside, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this one is more for delivery than content. He saved my life. T. <laughs> now, Cheryl, they haven't done her any more favors. They've given her any better lines. We burned a lot of mine, but one was one FP was talking to Archie about the possibility of him going to prison. This is, again, delivery, but he's like, gotta keep your wits about you, Red. Which, no one calls Archie Red. No. It's Redikins. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> The thing that keeps me up most nights isn't that I might get shipped. It's that I won't be able to graduate with you guys. <laughs> also bad. Just get a GED, Archie. It's fine. <laughs> How does it feel to be an honorary serpent? Feels pretty savage, Jug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we've hit everything, though. I, I still think the best one, the perfect line ever delivered. It's the ghoulies, Jug. Those bastards have hot dog. <laughs> I definitely laughed out loud when, yes, <laughs> when that line was delivered. Those bastards have hot dog. <laughs> but I mean, such a good episode. I want to give it four out of five arrows to the chest. <laughs> <laughs> this was so good. I think we were getting burned out on season one. Uh, this is five out of five directions on the compass. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is absolutely like a 4.5 out of 5 mop dogs. <laughs> oh, wait. Uh, did I say 4 out of 5? I meant to say 4.5 out of 5. Ooh, upgrading it. Wow. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I just I got too excited by arrows to the chest and forgot to finish part of the sentence. You just like caved to peer pressure because Hunter and I rated it higher. <laughs> yeah. We're like, damn it. <laughs> this was a good one. Yes, it was, was fantastic. I'm so uh. glad that we did this and we're just going... Feet first into complete wild catastrophe. I can't wait to learn more about the Gargoyle King. I hope it is every bit as good as the King in Yellow was in True Detective. (laughs) Haven't seen True Detective. I think Riverdale's probably better. Well, as it turned out at the end of True Detective, the truest detective was the friends we made along the way. (laughs) (laughs) So, I guess let's say goodbye. All right, thanks for listening to Gritty Reboot. Make sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, leave a review because it really helps us grow. Next week, we'll be discussing Riverdale Season 3, Episode 2, Fortune in Men's Eyes. In the meantime, you can reach us on Twitter at Gritty Reboot Pod or by email at Gritty Reboot Podcast at gmail.com. You can check out our website, grittyrebootpodcast.com, for info about the show, past episodes, and upcoming news. We look forward to seeing you next time. Don't take too many arrows in the chest. Cry comfortably.